As I prepare to express and purify proteins, I'm preparing my protein prep spreadsheet, and I want to show you how you too can achieve this feat. Okay, well, it's not really a feat, but keeping an inventory of your protein expression, like the cell pellets, as well as your pur purified proteins, can save you a lot of time down the line. Um, so we're talking things like how much, like if you express a protein in cells, what type of cells, how many liters of the pellet do you have, um, and then once you purify the protein, what's the concentration, um, are there any special notes, what's the buffer, various things like that. So you have this um, spreadsheet of all this information that you can look back on later. So yesterday I talked about how you can inventory your plasmids, and today I want to tell you about how you can inventory the proteins that come out of those plasmids. Um, and so yeah, let's take a look. Okay, so once again, this is going to be one of those more practical posts, um, less background and that sort of thing, but really something to help people um, get good ha into good habits for keeping track of things in the lab so that they can spend their time more productively doing the fun experiments rather than having to dig up all the information. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about today is going to be what we're doing um, once we have gotten cells to make a specific protein and then once we purified the protein out. So we talked yesterday about how we can keep inventories of our plasmid or expression plasmids. So basically when we stick the instructions for making a protein into a plasmid backbone um, and we want to keep information about the, um, the plasmid as well as the protein that it'll make. But then once we actually make the protein, then there's other information that we want to keep. Um, things about the buffer, the concentration, um, and that sort of thing. And once, even before we purify the protein, we have to get the cells to make it. And after we get the cells to make it, we typically like, we get the cells to make it and then we harvest them, we spin them down and we collect these cell pellets. And so some people, they, um, what I like to do is I typically, I spin the cells down and then I remove the media. So I take off the cell food, food um, and then I resuspend it in a smaller amount of clean liquid. Um, so this clean liquid is like your buffer um, with protease inhibitors and stuff um, to prevent it from being chewed up. And then I flash freeze this and I call it the pellet. Some people, they freeze it without resuspending it in a new buffer and then they just resuspend it in a new buffer when they when they go to purify it. Um, but so I end up with a bunch of tubes like this that have my protein um, in this inside of the cells. And then later, I will break the cells open and purify out the protein using various forms of chromatography. Um, and then once I get that purified protein, then I want to freeze it. So typically I like flash freeze it. I add a little glycerol, cryoprotect it. Um, so it doesn't like freeze all funny. And then what I'm going to do is freeze it in aliquots. Um, you want to keep aliquots so that you don't have to freeze thought too much. Um, if you have a lot of your protein though, you don't want to make a bazillion little aliquots because that's going to hurt your thumbs and because it's going to fill up a ton of boxes. And so typically what I do is then I make larger aliquots um, and then smaller aliquots. So the smaller aliquots for those like more the uses that like a single use type of thing and then bigger like sometimes I call these like stocks where I have a, more in the tube and then I can aliquot those out at a later date. Okay, and we'll get back to this in a minute. But first we have those cell pellets. And so when you keep a cell pellet, basically what you want to do is you want to make sure you know what those cell pellets are and what you have. This is going to help you, especially if you have a lot of different proteins that you're expressing and later purifying. It's sometimes maybe you want to express them all at the same time. Um, and then you'll purify them each individually later. Maybe sometimes you're expressing something and you don't even know when you're going to be using it. Um, but maybe it's something like a TEV or something that's kind of like a lab stock type of thing. And so you want to have a lot of it in the freezer so that when the lab stock runs out, someone can do a new purification of it. And so you want to know what you have and whether or not you need to express more. So. Um, it's really important that you know what you have and then also that you update this spreadsheet whenever you change anything. So if you were to go, so say I say, okay, so I expressed these cells, I have eight liters of TB. So TB is just um, a one of the bacteria foods we can use, this terrific broth. Um, it's a richer media than the lysogeny broth that will be. Um, and so I say, okay, so I have these and I have it in these BL21, the E3 cells, which are these types 
of um, bacterial cells that are really good for expression and they allow you to do this like inducible expression that I've talked about in the past. Um, and so you can induce them by adding this chemical called IPTG. And so then when I have my cell pellets, I like to keep, okay, so if I did an inducible expression, what were the conditions of that expression? So I say, okay, well, in this prep, I induced it with one millimolar IPTG when it was at OD 1.5. So this is telling you about how, how like dense the cells were, like how far grown were they, how crowded was that cellular media. And this makes it really, um, this makes it like cloudy. And so with the OD, the optical density, if you shine light through it and it's in a cuvette and then like it goes like how much is absorbed versus goes through and then you get this value, this OD. Um, and so I induced it when it was OD at 1.5 and then I grew it overnight at 18 degrees Celsius. This information can then be helpful if you have um, a high yield or a low yield, um, you can look back at your notes and say, okay, was there something different about that? What was the conditions? Um, maybe you want to recreate those conditions in the future, or maybe you want to try something else out. And so it's helpful to have that information along with the along with the information about when the pellet was collected. And so then for each time you collect more, you can then have a new line. Um, but remember to remove this once you've actually used that pellet or at least like put a line through it or that sort of thing. Also, maybe you don't want to use all eight liters of the pellet. Um, and so maybe you'll use part of it and make sure to make a note of that so that you know that you don't have a full eight liters left. Um, it's also helpful to put the number of tubes if you have multiple tubes. Um, and also on the tubes, you can write like one of four, two of four, three of four, four of four, that sort of thing. Um, so that you know when you're in the minus 80, when you're digging through all of those various tubes, you know how many tubes you're supposed to be looking for. Okay, so you want to keep that information. Um, the code and the names is the type of thing that I was talking about yesterday, how I keep like a code for my various constructs, like some sort of number that's easier to you to reference as well as like a short name for them. And of course you want the date. Um, so date, state, states are very important. So these spreadsheets are to kind of help so that we don't have to always be looking back at our lab notes, um, but it's helpful to be able to, because you'll have more information. You can't put everything on the spreadsheet. And so having that date is really important to go and go back and look at your spreadsheet to see if there, or your lab notes to see if there was anything special about that date or that purification. And so also like, I like, to keep a physical lab notebook as well as a digital one. And so in my digital one, I can then easily search for that date. Um, and in my physical one, I can easily search for that date as a lab notebook and stuff. Um, but anyway, it's really important to keep information about the date um, so that you can then cross-reference with your notes. Okay, so now in the future, you go and you purify the protein. And sometimes it'll be a protein that you're going to purify multiple times. Um, in this case, you can do a separate line for each prep. And here you can, you can say if you use the protein, um, but you don't want to like erase it because it can be helpful to have this information because when you actually go and use that protein in the future, it's helpful to know which protein prep you were using um, in various experiments. Even if they were done in the past, you can compare between the preps and see whether anything was different. Okay, so for these different preps, so this was the constructs of before here I was talking about, okay, the cell pellet, and here I'm talking about some protein that I purified. Okay, so once again, I have the date. And then, but the, here I'm going to have some other information. So one of these things, so for the construct in general, I will put the molecular weight in the in kilodaltons, or you can put it in daltons, but just remember whether you have kilodaltons or daltons. Um, and so basically a kilodalton is a thousand daltons and a dalton is a gram per mole. Um, and so basically this is a way that you can convert between a value that's in like grams or grams per liter or that sort of thing to a value that is in molarity. Um, so moles per liter. Um, so when that, here we're talking about like the actual number of copies of a protein instead of just how much the protein, how much protein weight you have. And so, because how much protein weight you have is going to depend on the size of the protein. So you can have a lot of copies of a big, of a little protein weigh the same as a single copy of a bigger protein. And so it's not really fair to compare them based on their weight. Um, but it's easier to measure and that sort of thing in terms of their weight. So then we can use this 
uh, molecular weight. So it's going to tell you how many grams of a protein you need in, in a mole. Um, and so a mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd copies. Um, and so for if you had a bigger protein, it's going to have a higher molecular weight and a smaller one is going to have a lower molecular weight. Um, and so the average weight of, a, of an amino acid, it's just what protein letter is about 100 Daltons, which is 0.1 kilodaltons. So you can basically about, you're going to have about a protein is, that's like 100 kilodaltons, going to be about 1,000 amino acids, a protein that's um, 25 kilodaltons is going to be about 250 amino acids. Um, but you can get the actual molecular weight using a software like XBASE prop param. And so I talked to yesterday about how we can put, how I put this information into my um, construct inventory. So my plasmid inventory database. And so if you have it here already, it makes it really easy to find it and put it over here. If not, you can always look it up now and remember to take into account any tags or any truncations to your construct. So maybe if, if it's like a, if you cut part of the protein off to see maybe does that protein do something or maybe it's disordered. So it's with hindering your expression, so you cut it off. Make sure to take that into account when you're using, when you're figuring out the molecular weight because that will change it. But anyway, the reason we put it here is because it's going to help us convert between the mix per mil and the micromolar. And so we talked about um, molarity which is moles per liter, micromolar is um, going to be micromoles per liter and a micromole is a millionth of a mole. So basically you have 10 to the sixth micromoles per one mole. Um, so I have some example calculations over here um, to show how you can go from the molecular weight in Daltons and the megs per mil to micromolar or the molecular weight in kilodaltons um, to, to micromolar as well as a specific example for this case. So I have the calculations here just so that you can help see what's going on and do it with paper if you want, or you can just, if you have it here in your spreadsheet, then you can have the Excel file um, do this math for you. Okay, and this is helpful because what you're going to measure is typically in like the MIGs per mil. And so you can use from that, that construct inventory where you have the absorbance, you can then use spectroscopy based methods in order to convert between the absorbance at 280. Um, so when you shine ultraviolet light through it, um, how much is getting absorbed. And then you can use this number, which you can get from that XBASE prop param software again. And then you can put that in um, and get the concentration it makes per mil. You can also use something like a Bradford assay. Um, but then you want to be able to convert that into micromolar so that you, when you are doing an experiment where you need to be having certain like ratios of various um, proteins or that sort of thing, you can then know the micromolarity of each instead of just the mix per mil, because remember we have that bias where the big protein is you're gonna have less copies in the same amount of weight. Um, and so keeping it, it, having the value in the micromolar can be really helpful too. Other kind of information that you'll want is the what, how it's stored. So both in terms of the base buffer, so the PGF here is this, I give my, um, I give my buffers abbreviations so I don't have to write everything out. Um, so PGF is just like um, this phosphatase gel filtration buffer because this LPP is just a lambda protein phosphatase that I was using in some of my experiments um, in my grad school work. Um, and so this was the buffer it was in, but then I also added 50% glycerol um, when I stored it in order to protect it from getting all like having ice, bump, ice um, crystals forming and um, messing it up. So this is basically just an example. And then for each protein in each prep, you would have a different one of these. Um, and so you, you do a little upfront work when you're doing that purification, which can be kind of hard because you're really exhausted at the end of the day. Um, but it's really important to just put this information down now and then you'll have to look back much less later 
Um, and so it's another one of those things you can do as you go that makes it a lot easier um, in the future when you're actually using this purified protein that you made to do fun things. And so hope this helps and happy purifying and then doing things with your protein. Um, and yeah.